like physical chemistry, which is kind of a cross between uh, sort of quantum physics applied to chemistry. So it's, it's kind of mathematically intensive. Uh, and then uh, work with a company computer aided drug design. Most uh, drugs, pharmaceutical companies, have teams of mathematicians using math to help design drugs. Thank you enough. Uh, to find like what kind of drug would have a special antibiotic and antiseptic or not. Uh, and interesting, it's the same kind of math that you use in that application to an engineer. So it's kind of a funny world. And a couple of those other ways that the math of mathematic techniques developed in one area are perfectly applicable to others. And work in scientific computing systems. Um, uh, the Institute for Scientific Information uh, creates a database basically of all the research. So one of the things that uh, had access to is basically a database of all known uh, scientific research. And you know what? Hardly any of them in horology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Extraordinarily little in scientific and scholarly scientific literature on horology research. So most of it's sort of been really more difficult to access in two places, like an SSC bulletin. And also patents is a really rich source. Actually, I could sort of have a whole talk on that. And, and, uh, all the really good stuff appears in, in patents. Uh, uh, actually, just recently I changed jobs on the site, but it's Raleigh, North Carolina based uh, dot com that does uh, research material for here. So. And uh, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say that since I'm a hobbyist, that probably doesn't cover it now. I'm sort of an obsessionist. <laughs> you, you really see the, uh, the depths of my madness as, the, uh, as, I, as I talk goes on. For, uh, uh, basically, if I have any free time, I travel a lot, and actually I do a lot of this on airplanes, and uh, otherwise it's after everyone goes to sleep at night. Uh, look, look at a historical perspective on watch theory. Uh, I've all seen in the text big names of Grossman, apparently the two of them, Jules and Herman, I think, Phillips and Aaron, and they derive formulas describing behavior on a fairly limited number of factors. Um, interestingly, uh, much of the much of the theory is coming from people who, sort of like myself, are sort of not really watchmakers, but physicists, uh, especially in the early days, a commission to, uh, to study horology. And because uh, the whole, uh, the book and women longitude is very clear, a big commercial inter interest in navigation. So there's a huge commercial interest in, in, in funding scientists to figure out how to get chronometers. And as far as I can tell, and uh, someone here may have even more knowledge, uh, Phillips uh, accounts I've heard was a geologist, geophysicist, who was commissioned uh, to, to do his research to help uh, horology. And Hooke uh, is a very famous Dr. Hooke uh, for Hooke's Law. Right? They teach you Hooke's Law in physics, but they don't mention that he discovered it for watches. That's what he did one day. He's also very well known in biology and other fields. Uh, he's the first one to use microscopes to uh, study, uh, study uh, bacteria and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I can feel relieved I'm in sort of a great tradition of scientists who uh, sort of apply their knowledge of horology, but we're not uh, professional watchmakers. But I actually was a hobby, and actually I started on mechanical watches, and I read all the books. Uh, Henry Fried's books and uh, all the everything else I get my hand on. And you read in many places these kind of truisms, like overcoil, reduce uh, side pressure and friction, and then so forth, they result in isochronism. Okay. At 220 degrees amplitude, uh, it eliminates poison here. So, you know, as a, as a scientist, start getting curiosity, and basically, what's the deal with this? You know? <laughs> How does that work exactly? And, uh, and if you look very carefully, uh, most of the texts sort of gloss over the math. One is, uh, not everybody's really interested in it, but... One little clarification. Yeah. You say increasing, are you saying improving a isochronism or not improving? Improving it. Improving it, okay. Yeah, increasing isochronism. So I was really interested in, like, why, why are those things true? How do those things come about? And that's, that's where it all started. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a quick uh, technique, and I think Gary will appreciate it. There are two uh, kinds of techniques. Analytical is the one that has always been used in the past, and that's derived form using formulas that uh, describe motion. Uh, closed end formulas, the, the uh, period of a pendulum is uh, 2 pi times the square root of length over the force of gravity, that kind of thing. Um, and those are powerful, but more, more complex systems 
like watches and actually pendulums, actually, if you really want to get detail or, or ridiculously complex or something that seems so simple, uh, is a numeric method that simulates behavior based on physical rules. And this is very much more powerful and almost the only way to look at things that are very complex. It's what, again, I use in drug design to actually design drugs and molecules and DNA and, you know, this human genome project, part of it is uh, used in that a lot. Because uh, it can simulate very complex systems. Uh, the disadvantage is you don't always get a formula back out that you can apply to everything. You have to sort of extract the insights and draw conclusions from the simulation. Uh, but those uh, early workers, although they're very distinguished and actually had some quite powerful math, George Airy, if you read his articles, uh, has some wonderfully elegant calculus that uh, has rolling stuff as well. But there is a limit. They did not have these numeric uh, simulations available because uh, their computers weren't so good. Basically, slide rules, best they had. So basically, these techniques and the whole actually areas of mathematics that have the knowledge of these techniques since it wasn't developed until really starting in the 70s, and it really flourished, and I have to say I was part of that in the, uh, in the 80s of the uh, research from that area. So what can you put into these simulations? Um, almost everything, the strength of the spring, the exact shape of the spring. That's again with the formulas like uh, Lassier and Phillips, they assume perfect Archimedean spirals. So the simulation, we can simulate it kinked, crooked, all kinds of things to see what happens to it. The inertia, the balance wheel, the amplitude, course of gravity, you know, how much work on Jupiter or something. You know? <laughs> uh, you know, but of course, gravity is an important uh, component of how watches run in real life. And uh, various kinds of friction, which you'll look at, look at in, uh, in detail. So basically, uh, we can put all kinds of factors in here. And I haven't actually completely explored the effect of every possible factor just yet. Uh, and that's also one of the things I was very interested in coming here to talk about, to get your feedback on your experience with watches. Because just because some of these things don't completely match your experience doesn't mean, she, doesn't mean um, you're wrong or I'm wrong. It just means I may not have put all the possible factors into the simulation yet. So basically, I simulate uh, the spring in segments using Hooke's law and the force constant for the bending of these little segments. So it's like little iron bars that bend. Uh, uh, graphic. Uh, using Hooke's law, it basically obeys that the strong spring makes things move faster, higher mass makes things vibrate slower. Um, so that's basically, although this computer is too fast for the simulation, the one on the left is the, has the highest mass and it's moving the most slowly. So uh, you know, it reproduces things like the obvious things like a heavier balance makes it run slower. So this is a low resolution example of just a few segments to simulate a spring. In practice, I used about, uh, about between three and four hundred segments, discrete uh, segments. Uh, one other tool I created to visualize these things is a program to visualize what the springs look like colored by spring. I need to turn the lights out at this point, though. At least the, just the fluorescence will do. See this better. Um, so that as the spring winds and winds, there's a lot of talk about how it stresses and strains here. So it's colored by strain in that uh, the blue areas will indicate an uneven strain, the highest strain. It's in a spectral or spectrographic order, where if the red is the lowest strain, blue is the highest strain. So it does the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, blue, green, violet. Uh, and so you can immediately see interesting things uh, again are not, uh, not shocking or surprising. The larger springs uh, distribute strain more evenly, and it will definitely give a better result. You mean larger with a thicker spring and fewer coils? Uh, the left larger means that it has more coils. Just, uh, just the fact that it has more coils on it makes it uh, to get the spring more. And not even that, so you can see the depth of my uh, It's if you actually write the program, it's actually dynamically look at the motion of the spring. Uh, as you can see, as it winds up on the left hand side, turning all blue, and you notice uh, just because this will come up later, the part that gets strained uh, is at 90 degrees to the, uh, where the stud is. This is the stud up here, or sort of where the regulator pins would be, you can think of it either way. This is the center, this is the collet, 
And uh, you want to guess what that is? Let's have a guess. The center of gravity. Yeah. Yeah, the center of gravity. It's actually amplified in SUMA, so you can have a better view of what it's doing uh, moving around. Uh, like uh, the Grossman spent uh, a lot of time computing the center of gravity very laboriously with a computer calculation that's actually very simple. And, uh, it's, it's almost trivial to compute the center of gravity. Of the hairspring or of the balance of the cell? Of the hairspring. Uh, again, as you see here, here's the stud about 90 degrees, or right around here is where all the strains seem to pile up in both directions. And the same thing is true for the, uh, for the larger strain. Uh, this one, actually, an example too, you see I put in there a, uh, uh, like a, I call it old fashioned pinning point, it has a little tongue sticking out. You can simulate that as well. Huh. See, the center of gravity makes sort of that classic, almost W shape that you see in books. So that, uh, that, are, that way how they're calculating it in most of the uh, text is more or less correct. It's sort of a, a looping W. So it doesn't seem to be as perfect as the, uh, the diagram from the book, so we can find that a lot. So again, you see here the blue area where the strain is accumulating is here at the bottom, I think you'll see, there you go. It's like 90 degrees. So what, what, is this a finite element program? Excuse me? Is this a finite element program? Uh, that's a, actually, I wrote it myself as a sort of vector calculus thing, but the same principle. I wrote, just wrote it myself and see, it wasn't anything that had high enough performance. Yeah. Each of the points and each of the graphs, you see it takes about four hours to compute. So each graph is about, each line of each graph is about three days. So let's look in, uh, so the whole thing in total is about uh, 26 months total compute time. The uh, isochronism and flat hair spring. Well, one thing that I was looking at, one of the biggest impacts, let's kind of jump to it, you know, of isochronism, uh, which is basically uh, keeping the same uh, timing for high and low amplitudes of balance as the, uh, as the mainspring runs down is the angle between the pinning point and the either regulator pins or stud, but uh, you can think of all these uh, simulations as being free sprung without uh, regulator pin. Yeah. And just to jump to that for a moment, you see there's a very high dependence on this, uh, on the isochronism. And now this is similar to Lossier, a paper, an article in 1899, very similar, that was reproduced in Rawlings, and a guy named Philip Woodward actually had something in the uh, Horological Journal, 1998, about this. So this actually, uh, I was very confident when I got these results, because this is reproducing more or less the uh, uh, earlier results. Now here's the interesting thing, is uh, what you want for your, for your watch to keep really good time and the isochronism means that it should have the same time all the way across. But the typical operating region is uh, maybe maybe a concern here because look, maybe I'm a little conservative here because uh, I don't have high grade watches much at home. I have these uh, antique watches, and even getting them up to 200 degrees is a, is a project. But uh, but basically, what you want for isochronism is that this line be flat all the way across in the operating range from from wound to unwound. It doesn't matter that much whether it's high or low, because you could adjust the timing on it, but you want to have a curve for it before it's flat. Now, I was pointing out the, the interesting correlation when um, you first saw those uh, movements of it, one being uh, the bunching up and stranding at 90 degrees, because the worst points are as when, it, when it is at uh, zero degrees and 180 degrees, have the highest. Uh, so this is at the pinning point of zero degree. This is sort of the worst worst case. You can see it bumping up in a very high strain there. So you're saying pinning point uh, in the column relative to the hairspring stuff? Yes, or the regulator pins, whichever you have on this particular the one. Uh, saying that's the worst. Well, at, uh, at uh, zero and 180 degrees, yeah. 
we have come to that because I had, from the, I had some conversations and uh, the recommended angle is actually that. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that. In this case, uh, you know, the, the variation is pretty high. Now, another factor in, in modern watches is that uh, in addition to doing anything with the hairspring, the other technology on the other end of the power train uh, helps out a lot, which is a couple of things. One, the uh, S-shaped uh, uh, mainspring has very uh, constant power over its entire life, so that's one way the problem is reduced. And uh, marine chronometers and instruments like that, the Fusee, even uh, in addition to that, uh, makes the power delivered to the, to the balance wheel very constant over the run of the spring. So that's like solving the problem on the other end of the power train as well. Now when it's close to 90 degrees, it starts to be almost ideal, very, very flat. Now the disappointing thing in these kind of diagrams, it still budges up a lot. It still, uh, it still has pretty high strain around 90 degrees to where the, uh, where the stud ends. Uh, but it does seem to have pretty close to isochronal performance. But it's at 90 degrees? Yes. And, that, and this is the best performance. Here, originally, I know uh, like the recommended angle is zero, but the only thing that comforts me is that Lossier and other people got these same results, so I had some confidence that the, uh, at least I was getting the same results they were. And I'm kind of blowing that up close to around 85 degrees. There is some dependence on the number of coils. This, this, uh, uh, this line is 14 turns, but these other ones are about 9 turns. That seems to be around like this area, seems 85, 86 degrees. Uh, gives a fast isochronism. Although none of them are really perfect. So. This is relative to zero, where it has a very small amplitude. So again, the actual displacement on the graph up and down is important. It's the flatness of it is uh, important. So it's not uh, well, it's an interesting result. What do we do with that? Uh, and there are some other findings too, which is interesting, is that there's an unequal force for the clockwise and counterclockwise motion of the spring. It takes uh, more force to unwind it, actually. Uh, and if you can computationally, although it's, it's difficult to detect, there's a different period for each half of the cycle. Now, you probably, if you're adjusting the beat with a uh, electronic timer, you're automatically un uncompensating for that. But as a natural function of the spring, it, it, it actually has a different winding and winding. But the first and initial uh, an interesting point is that this simulation was done without taking into account uh, any pivot friction. Um, and uh, so friction was not necessary to reproduce the lack of isochronism. Which was an interesting point because most of the watchmaking texts say, uh, point out that it's friction and the side pressure that causes it to lack isochronism and that the overcore reduces it and therefore it is isochronal. Everything's wonderful from there. Uh, no, no, not really. This, the picture this is already starting to look a little bit hazier uh, in that respect. Um, uh, from these calculations. Uh, the isochronism is really coming from somewhere else. It's not, and I'll show, it's not necessarily having much to do with the friction based on uh, uh, it being a flat air screen and bunching up the coils. So that's when, that's when things start to get interesting. So let's look at the errors in, in the isochronism a little more closely. It's a rotational force. Uh, actually, this is from another virtual reality system. I actually had the jewels and jewel settings done in virtual reality as well. <laughs> the, uh, when, you, when you're rotating a, a wheel, only force tangential to the pivot accelerates the balance. In other words, uh, to explain, if you turn a bicycle upside down, if you turn a bicycle upside down and grab the wheel, if you put your hand on the top of the wheel and whisk it this way, the wheel spins like crazy. If you pull it straight up, you know, it doesn't spin at all, you're pulling it straight up. So like the force that's tangential is the one you know, across the top, that's the one that gives it motion, that's the one that makes the balance wheel move. Any force that's pulling up has no effect on the uh, motion of the balance wheel. The force the radial to the pivot is wasted and doesn't accelerate balance. At any time, the combination of the force from the hairspring 
on the balance uh, on the comet is a combination of those. Some of the force is rotating and some of it is wasted. Some of it's, uh, that bunching up force is wasted. Uh, and that's really the source of the, the error, the isochronism. So for example, so if you graph the total force versus rotation, it's uh, force per linear, this is pretty expected. This is basically Hooke's law, actually, who came up with this in 1550 or whatever that was. Uh, so that's pretty good. But this is uh, like a pretty fine scale. So what if we subtract out the linear portion just to go Hooke's law and only look at the errors, the imperfections? We get this. That's the error versus rotation. So that's the force that's radial that's not being used to rotate the balance. And no, that's, this, that curve is the source of it uh, not being isochronal. Does this vary, though, in pendant and dial position? You bet. Uh, pendant and dial position. Between pendant and dial position. Yeah, I'm not sure that later. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, so that is effective. Okay. Uh, you look at the scale of this. The one on the left, the scale of the 45,000, and I forget, I think it's millidies is the force. But the important thing is on the error of rotation, the scale is only up to about 600. So the error is about 1.3% of the force at its maximum. So it's a very small amount. But in horology, small amounts count a lot. <laughs> uh, and this is why uh, one of the issues is you don't see lots of, uh, lots of advanced physicists doing anything interesting in horology. Most physicists like to use approximations for things. Approximations don't work that much. Those t the two slopes should be equal. Is, are they not? Is it, they're not equal. Actually, that's the point. They're slightly, slightly unequal. The, mm -hmm. the unwinding force is slightly, slightly different uh, than the winding force. How much difference is the slope? Uh, I think about 0.1%. It's not not a big difference. Not as much as the friction. You said the friction is how much? Right. Well, this isn't friction here. This is this is just the component of the force that's not moving the balance wheel. Sort of the wasted force. Uh, Mossier, in his original work, I think he called it the uh, uh, parasitic force. <laughs> How did you calculate that error? Just very quickly. I uh, looked at the uh, force vector. This is all done with actually vector calculus. Looked at the force vector on the uh, collet and just decomposed it into a tangential and non tangential point. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or another way, we could, your two lines that look really straight are not really straight. Right, right. This so you just took out the straight portion and it blew up the, the variation on either side of the straight line? You got it. You got it. Exactly that. You better see, because this is very small, 1.3. You couldn't really see it on that scale of uh, 45,000, but when you subtract it out. Now the different pinning points change the shape of this error curve. And the isochronism depends on the symmetry of this curve. Does it balance, do, do the errors on each side going clockwise and counterclockwise balance each other out so that they end up canceling? So here at uh, 0 degrees. Uh, I think this is uh, 0 degrees here. Uh, they don't balance each other out. At 180 degrees, it's sort of the opposite of that. And around uh, 90 degrees, I think that's what we call it, it's sort of nice looking, and they sort of balance each other out. They're equal on each side. Now, you see this little gap here. Uh, it's, it's an interesting point. You have to actually include in the calculation some internal spring friction for the whole thing to work. Um, otherwise, the spring will actually vibrate back and forth in addition to rotating. Uh, the internal friction is the same friction. If you take a piece of metal and you bend it back and forth really fast, it gets hot. Just like when you rub your hands together, that's friction, but it's inside the metal. And all springs have that, and it reduces their ideal behavior very slightly. Um, and that's why in a real watch, air spring doesn't vibrate back and forth. It damps, it, after just a few seconds, it damps out and it behaves like you normally see it. And you actually have to have this for the simulation to work. And that's why you see that little gap here. It's not a perfect line. That's, that's because the force going forward and coming back is slightly different because of that internal friction. I asked, what did you use in terms of, do you think in terms of damping as loss factor, tan delta, what, or percent of critical damping, what did you use for your uh, percent of uh, Percent of the radial movement for the, uh, for the uh, internal friction, or air friction. Okay. 
done this before. Well, I've uh, been <laughs> a mechanical engineer and, and I've worked in vibration and vibrating systems. Yeah, we talked about the damping, the way right. with no damping, the spring, the spring on the mass vibrates forever, and never comes to rest. With damping, it finally damps out. Right. Uh, or it's damp, damping, uh, not damp ending. <laughs> but, uh, so we talk in terms of what's the, what's the loss factor of the material. The material's got two properties. It's got this modulus of elasticity, right. and for vibration, you get, it's damping. But I think in terms of loss factor, this four is percent of Great. Yeah, this is basically right, the percent of damping, that's right. The percent of the motion is uh, actually it's really tiny too, like two times negative, or two times 10 to the minus four is about, it's enough. It's yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can detect the difference between 85 and 90 degrees, very small, and you can hardly even see it on the graph. But even that's it's significant on a horological scale. So yeah, actually point one, unwinding is stiffer by about by 0.1%, and then, oh gosh, that's, for a for a for many physics solutions, that's as accurate as we need the solution. Well, on a watch, that's 86 seconds a day, <laughs> and uh, you know uh, people get kind of cranky if their watch is uh, off 86 seconds a day. Talking about the reef panel, watches are so, uh, so, so the error curve is basically uh, the correct for this by again moving the error curve so that the uh, uh, winding of the error is basically a symmetrical on each side and it's complex because the the force fact, the force, the force constant is different on each side, so it's not exactly 90 degrees on it. Uh, now, interestingly, it's something, it's, again, it's, it's easy on a computer. So you can actually compute the rate of the clockwise and counterclockwise rotation separately. You can sort of each, you can just look at every time it goes all the way to one side, how long does it take to go to the other side? And when it's all the way unwound by counterclockwise, how long does it take to go the other, back clockwise? And you can compute that as, as, as the rate over based on the amplitude. You can see at around 85 degrees, the count clockwise and counterclockwise errors make this uh, nice shape and they just almost symmetrically and completely cancel each other out. Where at it was 10 turns, uh, uh, like complete turns, uh, you can see well they sort of work together but they don't cancel each other out. Just another way to look at that. So now here's some of the fun of computers now, is, uh, uh, especially using a simulation technique instead of having a complete formula. And say, what happens if I like squish my hairspring and have some problem? You can simulate kinks and see what happens there. Uh, I've done all kinds of stuff. Uh, typically, the results aren't bad. <laughs> uh, let's say I uh, deform the hairspring to one side, and the idea I had for this, and it comes up later again, is like in Hamilton's timing book, uh, to correct positional error, you can say, well, if it's if it's uh, heavy or it's slow in this position, you can kind of push the hairspring up and, uh, and correct the positional error. So I want to say, what happens if you do that? Wrong button there. So we can simulate that. And you can see, already uh, on the left and right side, it's kind of bunchy and uh, doesn't look perfect anymore. And, uh, yeah, folks, I doesn't have a lot of my hairsprings left, but hey. <laughs> Just pra keep practicing. I keep practicing. Right. Right. <laughs> but fortunately, it's not on your watch. And this is without fitted friction, right? Yes, this is without fitted friction. Um, so you can see the results there, and uh, so you can simulate what happens when it's out around and actually coils bumping into each other and stuff like that. that that's pretty fun. So what happens when you do that? Well, here's the bad news. Uh, well, we're saying the good news, you can't actually correct positional error that way. The bad news is uh, your uh, overall error really just looks terrible. It really affects the isochronism a lot if you offset it. The more you offset it, the better it looks. The uh, you know, worse it looks there. So uh, it really screws things up. And you'll see you all over the place in this. You correct one thing completely, you screw up other things. <laughs> There was no total solution. It's kind of a miracle these things work at all, actually. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. And then, uh, and then we look in the, you know, through the text of the day again. You know, you'll be kind of, again, people get kind of cranky when the watch is uh, off by that much. Another thing uh, we can do is, so, uh, well, I suppose some people might say that uh, they don't really, well, not some watches they do, but a lot of watches they don't come right out of the comet, they come out of a little tongue. Again, the simulation provides a way to look at this. Uh, however, if you look at patents, my favorite source of watch technology, a lot of people use uh, laser welded and other techniques to uh, attach uh, things, and they act, some of them do actually come right out radially at the theoretically perfect angle. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think the Daniels movement, among other other ones, uh, are laser welded on there, so it has a perfect curve coming out. Uh, here's another interesting method. Uh, and the advantage of this one was touted as it has the same little curl as, as when the hairspring comes off of the machine that makes it, so you don't have to worry about pinning and having, having hand work done and crashing. Punches it right under the collar. So, I'm not sure what these watches are in production or anything, but this is from the patent literature. It's pretty easily available now on the web. Today, but it's very easy to find. And it has lots of nice information and principles in it. Uh, because when you have a patent, part of the deal is you get protection, but the other half is you have to completely describe what you're doing. With so here is uh, some of the results. This is this emerging at a 75 degree angle. This angle I'm talking about is this angle here as it comes out of come down. So this would be a 90 degree, and as you move over closer to the edge, uh, you get more of a, more of a tangential angle. You can see, you know, as we look at the simulation, the result really isn't dramatically different. Uh, the curves are pretty much the same. It does change the, uh, think that down. It does change the, uh, what the best angle would be. In this case, it goes down to about 92 degrees. Um, but overall, it's not, it's not a dramatic change in the, uh, the time of One that's a little bit more of a realistic angle. The other one that you have it break into the side of the collar is pretty, uh, pretty high incidental <coughs> angle. Uh, it moves up to here, it's about, uh, yeah, it's about 82 degrees. Again, it, it changes things, but it doesn't really have a dramatic change on, on how the timing works. Are you assuming your balance wheel added to there is to explode in a really weak? Mainspring really wound down and really wound up tight. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, right. For each of those points, I just use different energy on the balance wheel that simulates a different energy on the uh, on the mainspring. Right. Like I said, in each of those points, it took uh, well, depending on the simulation, between two and four hours for each point on each thing. Now here's another fun thing, uh, and this is getting to back uh, some some things that even Bossier had that he couldn't really investigate. So uh, there's a strain because uh, this, you know, the, it's bunching up because of the stud. What happens if we had a stud and we put it on a little track, and that track could, in a frictionless way, again, that's more <laughs> difficult to do in a real watch, but that little stud could move in and out as the balance wheel uh, moved uh, and relieve that stress. Would that make it better? No, unfortunately, it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. One is, is that you might be familiar with, uh, is the uh, you start to get lots of vibrations that don't jam out because now it's almost it's completely free and it goes back and forth and you get uh, well, you can start the last uh, presentation, but you get uh, secondary vibrational modes at various times, uh, which is which is a uh, even more elegant thing I was going to put on this harmonic analysis to actually separate out the energy vibrational modes. Well, you can see uh, it does actually increase, uh, uh, it makes the strain very evenly distributed. You don't see it bunching up as much. But one problem here is, and it's not as obvious in this simulation, but uh, there's another key kind of strain that's not being, um, let's see if I can actually stop this so it gets the right place, that's not being taken into account in that the stud also should be moving up and down a little bit too to completely relieve the stress. Okay. I mean, just catch it in the middle when it's sort of half mm -hmm. colored and half. 
Anyhow. It's, I mean, it's pretty evenly distributed, but it's also in addition to moving in and out, this, the spring is actually tugging pretty hard on this uh, stud when it's fully wound up. It should also be moving up in kind of a cycloidal curve if you really want to make it perfect. Uh, but uh, the, again, it had problems uh, because of the frictionless nature of this, of actually having it wobble a lot and vibrating a lot in ways that, that don't contribute to the uh, good timing. But it's just an interesting example of the kind of uh, experiments you can do, which would be uh, very tedious to do uh, in a workshop. So let's look at real practice for a second. And what could be more real than the Esplorose catalog? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's exactly what this is taken from. Many texts specify, actually, that you pin the angle at zero degrees, just like that, uh, as, as, the, uh, par, as the standard operating procedure of anything. Uh, Rowling's book says this compensates the difference in vertical and dial position. Here, if you imagine that the regular pins are going to fall around here, it's 180 degrees. However, from these simulations, you see the 180 degrees and zero degrees are kind of equivalent. They're symmetrical. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm still looking at this. I'm not sure how this works or why it's good. Um, I, w I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that it's the wrong thing to do by any means. Uh, I would jump to the conclusion perhaps I haven't looked at all the factors yet. Uh, because if you're running a watch flat like a marine chronometer, and I, I haven't actually taken one apart, but from Rowling's book, it indicates it is about 90 degrees pinning angle for a marine chronometer. Uh, that might be perfect, but in a, in a watch, you're actually, and I'll get to it in a minute, you're actually flipping it all over the place, it's moving all over. So there's lots of other considerations. You want the average time uh, to be good. You don't necessarily uh, and, uh, assume that it's always going to be dialed up on someone's wrist and watch. Again, I think people get cranky and tell them you have to walk around like this all day for their Rolex to keep good time. Overcoils. Yes, we, uh, again, in texts uh, already we've seen a certain look kind of suspicious because they hail the overcoil as the thing that reduces the friction and, uh, and therefore uh, reduces that isochronic. Two things I found out quickly is that the pinning point is still very important to an overcoil, the angle uh, of the uh, pinning angle or to the regulator pin to the stud, and the start of the overcoil point is very important. No, I just forgot to mention, I forgot to mention there. Uh, okay. Just jump back just for a second. One thing to remember here is, uh, uh, is that uh, watches with regulator pins, to regulate the watch and you move those little things back and forth, you're constantly changing the at that angle. So again, it's a compromise. When you get good timing, you may have moved it to, let's say in this one, even five degrees, 85 degrees, and it really changes the isochronical performance a great deal as you move those regulator pins. And, uh, and that's, uh, well, one of the reasons uh, I've seen a lot of high-grade watches, or at least pictures of high-grade watches, <laughs> that are free-sprung, exactly. And so they're, it's set at the factory at the right place, and then you don't mess with it. You just uh, use timing screws or other mechanisms to do that. So, so uh, again, uh, that practice is consistent uh, with these results. It's the best way to get good timing is to get your hairspring in the right position and then adjust weight or the uh, moment of inertia of the balance wheel to uh, get your timing right. Now back to this. Overcoils. Well, this is pretty high dependence. As you can see, this is for a variety of pinning angles and it, it looks remarkably like the one for flat. Matter of fact, the, if you put them up next to each other and sort of define you to distinguish between them. So I did lots of experiments with different kinds of overcoils. Here's a couple of them. Uh, so this is like 20 degrees. Uh, there, there's at the bottom. Yep, it's symmetric, just like flat uh, air springs. You turn it around and it does that same. Uh, so around 90 degrees, you're yeah, okay. It's still around that. You get that right angle. It's, it's cooking. It's, it's doing, doing great. So uh, it shows the same effect. Just because you have uh, overcoil, doesn't mean that you magically have a spring that's going to be isochronal and have wonderful timing performance. Right. It's kind of crying, isn't it? <laughs> People say, yeah, brigade hair spring, yeah. good timing. Well, maybe. maybe. <laughs> if you haven't adjusted right, you can, you can have great timing. 
then the other one is, the other effect is you read about, well, you know, and you see lots of books, and it gets into sort of a mystic art of uh, the exact shape of that open coil. And actually, it does have an effect, but not the one you'd think. Let me, let me get to do that. Now, here's another fun thing with the computer. I can have exactly the shape over coil and change various aspects of the model without having to fidget with the real watch. You take it out, you just have to put it back in. I'm not sure exactly everything can change. Uh, I mean, these pictures didn't come out well. But basically, what I did is made a series of over coils where this model, first one, the overcoil comes in over the second coil. Here, this one's over the third coil, and then the fourth and fifth coil. To see, like, what, what effect does it have when the, when the overcoil is in or out over the uh, overcoils? Because you see these books, and yeah, this one came out clear uh, where these things are. As you can see from this graph, uh, the effect is not a lot. And sort of, yeah, this is sort of, a, you can get your feedback on this. If, if both conflicts and agrees with what you read in books. One, it agrees with actually what you see in watches, because uh, if you open up watches, you see that people, you know, depending on the size of the watch, the overcoil is all over the place, right? Inside, outside, big, small. And they tend to generally tend to work pretty well, right? Uh, but if you read in uh, theoretical books on text, they have these formulas, and you've seen in um, Andre Carlyle's book, has like 16 pages of, uh, of the little overcoil forms for how much you be. And in, for this study, in the conditions that I used, it didn't have that big effect. And also, this also is consistent with the book that say is actually holding up this, uh, it's supporting this whole uh, work of Rawlings' book, because it's actually underneath the projector there, propping it up. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he has sort of the same conclusion. It's not making, it's not making that big an effect, really. It's not, there's, there's some kind of uh, mystic magic going on here. It's, uh, it's it's, uh, it's having the same laws of physics that the flat air spring does. And uh, interesting that you see it, Lossier's chart reproduced for flat air springs. Actually, it's in Rowling's book other places. But you know, I've never seen this done for overcoils. I'm not sure why. Maybe they did it and they said, well, wait a minute, it's not flat. Maybe something's wrong. It's, it's not sure. It's, I'm not sure. Uh, also, I tried more variations. Uh, as you see, and, and basically when I work with hair spring, you get kinky things like that. But uh, basically, the, uh, um, someone can see, is that, is that good? <laughs> basically, if you have any kind of kinkiness or uh, like discontinuities, or it's not smooth curves in general, uh, let me just back a second, you get exciting results like this, where the performance, there's many kinds of overcoils that are really bad, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, they might kind of look good, but once you get to a certain kind of overcoil region, uh, some of the behavior just breaks down, and it's really terrible. And especially if you do this kind of thing. And the funny thing is, I sort of tried to copy these out of various texts and recommendation books uh, that I've collected of having you know, that shapes that look kind of like this and make a kink here. And both actually like don't work that well. The other ones that seem to be kind of finicky, and I don't know if this is your experience, the kind they find on Elgin watches that, that go straight across, that it's kind of finicky. If you get it in the wrong kind of position, it kind of has a, a breakdown, so to speak, where it really has very poor performance, even though it's not noticeably uh, different than if you move it to a place that's good performance. Any kind of overcoil hair thing does seem to breathe a whole lot more evenly than one that's just, that's just pinned to the outside. That's correct. But is that related to timing now? That's the question. Well, on the friction of the pivots, it would sure change a whole lot. Of us, but it's not. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Oh, okay. That's true. All these things are true. But, uh, you know, but, and actually, that's why I'm so glad actually to come here to actually uh, get. Because any scientific model has to stand the test of reality. Or us. Or watch watchers either one. And like I said, if it's not conforming to reality, the two things are wrong. Maybe you're not right, or maybe you don't have enough stuff in simulation. And uh, at this point, sort of the, the uh, latter is what I'm looking for. Then to look at more things. Like I said, so far it's more or less consistent. There have some interesting points that I brought out they haven't really seen before in watch making literature. So let's get to that friction thing that just happened to be mentioned. Funny you should mention that. Yes, if in fact the overcoil have 
about a quarter of the side pressure of flat air spring. Yep, so in fact, uh, that is true. Uh, it's not a, that wasn't a, uh, this guy even they told me that in fact it does uh, reduce the, the friction. Uh, in addition, uh, good oils lessen the importance of this, and we'll see in a second, uh, it's not a friction in modern watches, and it's, uh, it's actually re remarkably low. So the fact that it's, a, that it's a very tiny number, now it's a quarter of a very tiny number, it doesn't necessarily make a, make a big difference. But it is different, and especially like you, uh, especially as oil degrades and so on over time, I see, uh, the oil coil will have better performance uh, as the friction increases. Oh, so this is a little section, uh, and you'll enjoy this, it's a mechanical engineer. Let's talk about friction. The friction uh, of the pit is proportional to the side pressure, and there's two kinds of side pressure, one from the air spring, and when you put the watch on the side, there's that side pressure because gravity is going on. There's friction of spring bending, I already mentioned. There's also air resistance as the thing wafts against the air back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've read in text that uh, there's a noticeable difference on especially marine chronometers, I understand. Some of them have like little covers over the uh, balance wheel, and they have different performance characteristics when so you take them on and off. I don't actually have one, but that's what I read. But that would be consistent with this. Especially, you know, you have screws whizzing back and forth. There's lots of turbulence and, uh, uh, and stuff on your balance wheel. Air resistance. Yeah. So the, fr the friction is proportional to the normal force, at least in theory, independent of the area that's in contact. Although that actually is a part of physics that is some contest on it. Um, also, I think as it came up this morning, there's actually two kinds of friction, dynamic and static friction. Your balance wheel has dynamic friction. That's the friction of it constantly moving. All the rest of the watch has static friction, which is it's stopped, and now you have to have force to get it going, and it stops, you have force to get it going again. But static friction is usually much higher, like 10 times higher than uh, the dynamic friction. It has this whole different dynamic to it. And uh, Pete was here but this morning, he pointed out that's why the the jewel holes have to be uh, somewhat larger in the pivots so that they can actually start to roll to start up before it starts sliding against the uh, sliding against the jewel to overcome that initial uh, static friction and help it get going. That walked it over me. So the area we're looking at is the uh, uh, like the force of the pivot pushing against here, and now of course when it stays down, the end of the pivot pushing against the capsule. Uh, now the effect of dynamic friction, the effect of it is proportional to velocity, uh, and the effect is greatest when the balance is moving the fastest. But fortunately, that's when the uh, that is when the uh, side pressure is the lowest. So actually, uh, at least uh, the laws of nature are working for us in that. It's sort of the Sort of the um, like a more tangible example that is skydiving. You reach a terminal velocity. You don't just keep accelerating until you hit the ground. You're about 100 miles an hour. Uh, well, so the parachute comes out. You know what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like you go to about 100 miles an hour, and then the friction is equal to the velocity around that speed. So, so the friction, the effect of the friction, uh, increase technically the friction is uh, actually in the tangible velocity. <laughs> all right, I, I encourage you all to go skydiving and uh, <laughs> explore one of those two possibilities for you. <laughs> and again, uh, the air friction, of, uh, and all these actually technical sense of damping factors on uh, mechanical analysis is, is, is only, uh, the difference in some of these frictions is that uh, the air friction is only in this one direction. It doesn't affect the spring actually moving from side to side. So that was a, a fun part of the vector calculus in, in implementing that. Are you talking about air friction due to the breathing of yes. the spring? Oh. Yeah, and I'm pushing against the air. So we have to remove the, it's only on the motion that is radial from the center, not the side to side motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, here I went crazy, but at least there's one person here that likes this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, how friction is normally measured is sort of summed up in watches uh, by something called a Q value. Uh, I'm not sure where it started, but this is like really big in radio electronics theory as well. Like uh, Q, they call it in radio or impedance. Like your so 8 ohm stereo speaker has 8 ohm impedance. That's the same, actually the same thing as Q in your watch, maybe. Uh, 
Um, so I have these fun formulas uh, and we'll go over these if you like, but we'll have a few breaks first. But uh, we'll actually, we'll skip over those. But here's an example, here's a real life, because uh, I'm not that excited for that. Here's a, I have some, there's a particle from the SSC, the P of the day 500. They say the Q is about 100 for this. Um, now, the way Q is important is that the half-life half of the harmonic motion is natural log of 2 times Q over pi. Uh, sure, you use that every day. But the conclusion, <laughs> the conclusion of that is that if it, it, it takes about 22 seconds to reduce the amplitude to a half the starting value at Q100 if you plug in, uh, plug that in. So, so if you take off the pallet, you rotate the wheel around to 180 degrees, say, and let go of it, with a Q value of 100, it would take 22 seconds for it to go down to a 90 degree amplitude and a half rotation. But does that include uh, all the frictions? Uh... That's the air friction answer. The air friction, the friction. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure exactly how they measure that uh, in, a, like, in, a, in a watch, but that's really the only practical way is actually to start in motion, like the amplitude of the strobe light or something like that. You can't use a uh, fiber, you can't use a machine because it wouldn't be ticking at that point, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What would be the difference if, if it were in a vacuum? Well, how would that change? Uh, Q would be higher and take longer. Actually, we talked about the early session. Interesting talk about things in vacuum to do with reducing air, air uh, friction and like some reefer clocks I've seen in like a vacuum chamber. And I was wondering, I don't know what kind of oils they use, right? Because I used to do a lot of vacuum work uh, for research, and uh, when you put stuff in a vacuum, all the uh, volatile stuff in the oil evaporates and gets thick pretty quick. So they must have some either have to oil it a lot or uh, have some pretty special oils to get put stuff in a vacuum. The, um, uh, so, so that's the, uh, the higher Q, the better. And now, actually, that's pretty long, 22 seconds. That's, that's pretty impressive. And, and some texts I've read say that high-grade watches have Qs of uh, 2 to 400, which is, well, in one way, I'm skeptical, skeptical of, but if, it, if it's true, uh, uh, the amount of friction they have is, 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 is almost non-existent. Uh, and, Getting back to that uh, question on the side pressure and the friction, because the oil overcoil and non-overcoil, I mean, the friction would be so small that that difference in the in the pressure would be would be terribly significant. But let's look at the effect calculated. This is a uh, uh, friction on timing. This is over the same overcoil with three different friction levels, increasing by um, a factor of five each one. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Doesn't make a huge change. But uh, those little thin lines, the thick lines now here are the flat hair springs. And yep, as, as you would think, the flat hair spring, the friction increased. The, if you increase the friction coefficient, it has a much bigger effect because of the side pressure is much more. So uh, it, is, it is likely that over time, as if your oil degrades, the, uh, the, the over, as the oil degrades, the overcoil will be much more stable in timing over a period of time. But here's the... Uh, some conclusions, and uh, uh, I was going to put them in a horological kind article, but I want to run them by you guys uh, first. Take the status. The overcoil has no direct effect on the isochronism, as we saw. It still has lots of other, the pinning angle and other things are important. It does lower the side pressure and friction, there's no doubt. And boy, it must be hard to really get any spring in these watches. <laughs> <laughs> well, well wait, on the overcoil, he says, has little direct effect on it. Okay. Uh, synchronism, but it, it, your calculations are really based on no friction and the what? synchronism effect of the springs breathing is what's really not being affected very much. Is that, is that correct? Well, well, I actually have used these ones have friction. I explicitly did okay. a lot with friction in them as yes, well. Saw, okay. Uh, so, so, so even even then, it's okay. It, yeah, it's not it's not uh, the perfect like if especially. Uh, uh, Oh, yes, I, if you read the watchmaking text, you put the overcoil on it magically, uh, yeah. problems are solved. And, uh, and, you know. There is some effect, but it's not as, as drastic as right. what there right. is. But, but, yes, that's right. There is, a, there is an effect. It, it does make it better, but still that pinning point is really the angle, the pinning angle is the key factor for, for good performance. So that has more of an effect than an overcoil versus a right. flat bit. And here it is, and this is the same conclusion actually Rawlings had, so I don't feel like I have to go this. 
is what does the overflow give you? Well, it gives you a way to actually adjust that. It gives you an adjustable factor. For example, here's our wonderful uh, uh, picture from a favorite vendor, Esther Rose. And here's where you put your, uh, the regular things might be for something like this. So this is zero degrees in this case. Now, if you push the overcoil in or make it smaller, uh, since the spring has to be the same length, it pushes the pinning point over this way. Or if you pull it out, it pulls it out this way. So using that principle, you can adjust at will the isochronism of, of your watch just by pulling that in and out and, and make it just like the graphs I calculated come up to those flat points in that perfect timing. So there you have it. The, the, biggest, uh, the biggest effects and it gives you a way to adjust this. It's flat, what are you going to do, right? You, know, you have to make it longer and shorter than your timing's off. You have to make the balance heavier and lighter. So uh, that's one of the most, uh, you know, just from means of calculation, the most important effects or benefits of, of overcoil. The second one is, of course, still it does, it does reduce the friction, and that might especially be true when, uh, as the oil degrades and friction increases over time. Hmm. May I have a question here? Um, maybe to both of you, since you're both in the engineering end of things, and so are you. This, this uh, bending, as in the, initially at the, at the uh, comet, and as you bend and re-bend the overcoil, don't you have, aren't you introducing more errors due metallurgically? Due to that bending stress, don't you don't you introduce something that has a permanent effect? I, w I would when think so. It? Yeah, because the, the uh, like, yeah once you get beyond the uh, the uh, the uh, elastic limits. Yeah, yeah, elastic yeah. limits. Yeah. 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 So what what or does it by hardening right? Do it nuts when it cracks? Yeah. Or? What I'm asking you is is doesn't it? really take away some of the advantages of things like overcalls when you've stressed out the spring by sharp ends. I don't know. And uh, if you look at steels, this thing called the modulus of elasticity, which is how far it bends under load, right. doesn't change whether you're using a really cheap steel, like, you know, uh, let's say a bolt, you know, a cheap, like a nail, right. or you go a grade 10, really high quality aircraft bolt. Right. Both steel, they both will bend if you made up. A, be, a spring out it would bend the same distance under weight, but one, you can bend real far and it comes back to its right. undeformed shape. The cheap steel, you bend it too far, it's going to stay bent. Right. So that's like the hardness of it, and hardness doesn't really have an effect on the modulus of elasticity. It's still got that same resistance to bend. But wouldn't it create a, a point on that spring that would not... Yes. Uh, uh, flex as uniformly as the rest of the coils or the area around it. So it's a yeah. small yeah. portion of the whole length of the spring. Actually, I'm not, I'm not, if you have more experience in that you're probably not. not right. I just know that you look in the books and your formulas for bending of things are based on the modulus of this, yeah. not whether you're using a high quality steel or yeah. a cheap steel. It's a small point, but it's still, it's like the weak, the, the chain is the strongest. But I don't, I don't know the area. Uh, just because it's harder there, ready to break, yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that's really flexing any okay. part of the bend right there. I'm not sure. Maybe okay. it really does microscopically get a little harder and a little stiffer there, but I'm probably you know, interested in the question, really. No, it's an interesting one. It's, it's not actually part of the, the study. It's really there. why I've wondered if that is why a lot of the modern manufacturers aren't, along with cost, but aren't getting away from pinning a flat air spring into a round hole with a tapered pin. It just puts tremendous stress on it. And I'm wondering if that's why they aren't doing more uh, cementing and tacking uh, of springs rather than, than pinning and more clamping. Uh, and clamping. Yeah, flat, yeah. Between yeah. two flat flat I'm just really wondering if they're curve. trying to get away from metallurgical stress. Well, but it's only a, at the ends, right? Yeah. This end here, that end, you got all that stuff right. between them. Right. It's fine. But that first coil coming out is such a critical coil right. that if there's a property difference at that bend point, yeah. would that throw your timing off? even more aggressively because of the bend that has to be yes. put in it to get there. So uh, I wouldn't think so. Because it'd be constant, it would change over time, right? It's, it's just, yeah. it's such a small... Well, there's a point there, though, that you've got to remember about modern watches is that, generally speaking, when these, hair, when these hair springs are fabricated today and put in the watches, they're hardened, tempered, and stress relieved, basically put in without much of any deforming by the watchmaker or the machine that's actually well, putting the yeah. collet on and the stud on, and about the only adjustment is in the length uh, of the spring, and only that is done. It's actually that's done very rarely anymore uh, in 
modern watches, all, all of the uh, adjustment is done uh, through the weight of the balance. If, is that though, uh, what I'm asking is, is that done for theoretical reasons or is that done for cost reasons? That is done for both. It works out very well there. That, that's a very, it's a very equal equation, as you have to say. Yeah. So, uh, and again, this is an interesting conclusion, and not completely unprecedented because the Rollings had something similar. Which was good because actually I, I recently only bought Rollings book uh, through an AWA auction. <laughs> and, uh, so I only actually got this book after I had drawn these conclusions. And it's under your projector. Yeah, right and there. so his, his work's supporting yours. You bet. The issue of uh, the fact that off standard operating procedures that have the angle 0 to 180 degrees, I don't have an explanation for that, although the next section has another piece of it. I haven't put it together. Um, uh, to study this. Another st thing I started, I had a little piece of it later on, is actually started looking at uh, uh, real watches and doing I, you know, some software and made a timing machine to analyze real watches against this to see how they compare to the theory. Uh, my conclusion is I can pair watches. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, especially those in the chronometer club when I donate some. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> some chronometer. We'll be glad. We sure would be glad to help you out. Maybe a dozen or so uh, uh, Daytona. Oh, yeah, yeah. You'll get them to you. Yes, sir. Your secretary's job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, positional error. Uh, it's always been uh, a horrible thing uh, to keep position, keep time in different positions. Uh, those darn people keep moving around too much. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Uh, unless you have a marine chronometer, you put the thing in gimbals and solve the problem that way. That's kind of cheating, isn't it? Uh, and interestingly, uh, only computer simulations can really separate the poising and other errors. Now, for these positional errors, what I've done is actually looked at just the effect of gravity on the hairspring alone, not on the balance and the friction on the balance. So I can separate out using the computer the effect of gravity pulling on the hairspring versus uh, friction on the <coughs> The posi positional pounding is affected by balance amplitude, stiffness of the hairspring, the overall mass of the hairspring, and of course the length of gravity. There was one that I saw that in uh, Mr. Atonin's talk. He showed the, the watch that went to the moon, and it was like a uh, Omega Speedmaster. Yes. Is that one? Is that an honor one? No. Oh, it's not? Uh, yeah, I was wondering about that. Like in space, the auto wine didn't even work that long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, the origin of positional error is that there's, a, there's two main pieces to it. The effect of gravity on the hairspring, that make the hairspring sag down. Uh, now, the sagging is it's not really perceptible unless you had some kind of fine instrument. Like, when you put your watch up, you don't see it sagging down. But it's sagging, and the tiny amount that it does has an effect. It deforms the spring toward the earth, and sort of like a poise there from the spring. And there's also, the, of course, the friction on the pivot. Well, but here we can remove the friction on the pivot part to look at what is really the effect on the spring. So what it did is basically use a gravity, uh, actually a gravitational force vector, want to be technical about it, to simulate the watch being in different positions. So, so now it's under gravity. So gravity is uh, up and calculated rotating at 30 degree positions. And I believe zero degrees is. I always forget this uh, um, uh, pinning point up. Yeah, I believe that's the case. Uh, and you get this kind of a diagram, which is, again, a refreshing result because I just ran this to my program and it pretty much looks like the diagrams you see in most watch making pads. Yes. <laughs> again, I always look for those points of correspondence to make sure that it's not going to have completely completely blank down. So uh, also, because uh, there's a lot of uh, wristwatch pinning point, uh, at two points, the positional effect is, is zero, zero and 180. And, so, uh, and that is also an expected thing. And then at 90, it has uh, it gains a lot, and then at 270, it loses almost the same amount, but it's not, it's not completely symmetric. So the investigation was what kind of parameters are involved in uh, position there. Well, one of the interesting things I found right off um, 
fast. And this is actually pinned at 90 degrees. Now, the thing actually is disclosed again gets getting back to, and I have been worrying about this a lot, and why the standard operating procedure is to pin at zero degrees. Uh, it's possibly because the positional error may be less than it was at 90 degrees. In any case, uh, I'm still looking at it. Um, is that the positional error in general uh, depends a lot on the balance of the latitude. Now, that was a novel result I hadn't seen discussed before in text. As a matter of fact, at, at what you call the regular amplitude of uh, 220 degrees or higher, it looks like this and it looks like the books. But as, it, as the amplitude decreases, it actually moves to the opposite direction. It moves from left to right. Now it points to the left instead of to the right at low amplitudes. So you can immediately start thinking, and it's just like that poison. Well, I bet there's an amplitude right in between where the positional error is dead on. Yeah, and it's true. So it's a high dependence. The direction of the error reverses the amplitude changes. Um, and at about 180 degrees, uh, it is become centered, and there is no positional error. And then also you can use dynamic poison to correct for that. No, that's a new finding because previously it's been 220 degrees. No, he's well, this is hairspray. Hairspray, right. That's that's two different that's exactly right. And that's what I'm saying. Like, once you correct one thing, it screws up the other thing. So <laughs> you, can't, you can't get it all in one package. Like I said, it's amazing these things. This is the amplitude of vibration. This is the amplitude. This is the amplitude. Yeah. The, the 180 from amplitude, it, um, it, it reduces, at least in the model I had, the positional error. Not the poisoning error, the positional error based on gravity and the hairspray. If you, have a, if you have a heavy spot, closer to 220 degrees, the poisoning error. So like I said, there's no free lunch. If it was a magic world that all coincide, you would have the perfect one. Okay, so that's why it really doesn't do that on a timing machine, because it drives me crazy. Yeah, well, there's more on the poisoning error as well. But, uh, and so this is back to that graph of deforming the hairspring. Yep, if, if you take a hairspring and you deform it, like the books say, offset by about 10%, that's another way. It goes great. Of course, your isochronism really goes to hell, but hey. <laughs> but your position letter was good. <laughs> you can tell that to your customer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, it, but in fact, actually, uh, kind of make fun of it. But you know, if you have a, uh, like an S-shaped uh, mainspring and it's delivering almost constant power, actually, the isochronism may, depending on the watch, it may not be that big a deal. So, I mean, it's only if the balance amplitude is changing a lot would that really be a, would be a big deal. So. Well, they've been listening on the watch industry what the variation of that torque is, whether right. you know, like it was 100% wham and 75, 15, 25, right. you know, you must know what that difference in torque is. Yeah. How much does it vary? Does it vary plus or minus 10 over some average value, or is it varying 25%? Yeah. See, most of my watches are sort of the, uh, the less expensive kind of thing. So it's mostly like the 1950s, 1940s watches that had the old, uh, uh, Old style mainsprings that have very bad uh, power curves. So the big deal. Well, when you buy a new one, it's exactly. Exactly. You buy a new one from that shape, or you can ask for it. All that shape. Exactly, and, and so it just may be less of an issue actually with the new watches. That's what you know. I don't know what your uh, opinions are on that. Well, of course, self winding watches makes it right. less of an issue too. Right. Yeah, they're, they're always in power during the, the days when it's being moved, or during the day when it's being moved about. Right. That's why your gliding is so important. Even gliding on the barrel mm -hmm. Right. So I mean, I said there's like a lot of effect depending on what you want and the kind of watch you have and how much. Like if you can depend on constant power, this kind of very tiny correction for position. Like, hey, that might be. It might not have any bad side effects. If you're on your uh, your 1930E Howard it, with the original spring, it, 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 it may not be as good. So stiffness, as you'd expect, the stiffer the hairspring, the more it resists positional error. So. Uh, the, the ones that are inside the red has less, uh, the stiffer has less positional error. This again is two amplitudes, 215 and 130 degrees is all the way reversed on this frame. Uh, again, more experiments of a, of a similar, similar nature. And this is the position error. As you saw, the biggest errors in this model watch were at 90 and 273. So if you map those versus balance wheel amplitude instead of rotational, See at a point about 180 degrees, uh, the air is canceled itself out. We have almost a uh, reduced position for that. I'm sure you're not too excited about getting here, <laughs> reducing the amplitude of the balance. You know, but <laughs> again, uh, <clears throat> I also haven't investigated what 
that particular point depends on either if this is just one experiment or perhaps with more coils of different pinning angles that might actually have a move back and forth. But really. your zero point is about 300, huh? Uh, yeah, it crosses again. Interesting shape, isn't it? Yeah. So actually, in around 300, which is a uh, also which is a much more reasonable. I am doing this good. It actually goes down again. Yeah. yeah. Now the other thing again for overcoils, as I mentioned, I didn't have investigated fully the effect of overcoil on this. We think because the shape is different, uh, it will have it will have an effect on. Uh, uh, and actually, I've done some sample studies and uh, had some effect, but it didn't, so far it didn't seem that, uh, that dramatic. So let's look for a second. Again, I say I always look for ways to compare with, you know, let's, let's, see, what's, let's see what's in some real work. Explore. Well, that seems to have a flat hairs for a minute. Uh, so then you seem to figure out how to keep it. You know, I seem to have figured out uh, to keep pretty good time. I couldn't tell from this what the uh, pinning angle is in that particular model of launch, but it just shows uh, that uh, the premise that overcoils are absolutely necessary for good timing isn't, isn't really true. Here's another one. As long as you're going to uh, go to the trouble of making an Omega with a Daniel coaxial escapement, you're probably going to want to have a good timing, um, and uh, it doesn't have an overcoil. And uh, look at the angle of this. This is really interesting. Uh, this, now, this is closer to what my theory would expect. It's, uh, well, I'll show you there. It's around 60 to 65 degrees. But again, uh, uh, they're pretty smart guys at uh, Omega. And you can say they sell. They always seem to have to take everything figured out. Um, but it's not an overcoil, and they seem to get great performance from it. Uh, I don't actually have one to measure that. Again, if anyone would like to donate to the, uh, <laughs> or the Daniel. I can give you a little feedback on that if you like. Sure. Um, I know that uh, Derek Pratt was given one by George uh, when it was released. And so Derek, uh, some people here may know who he is, but he was an English guy. He's lived in Switzerland for about half his life. He's about 16 now. Uh, very, very good friend of George. So anyways, Derek took it home. Threw it on the timing machine. He said, "Oh my God!" He said, "It looked horrible." <laughs> he said, "We were just really astounded at it." So he had a decision to make: Was he going to go in there and start playing? Because <laughs> he, you know, he's done a lot of work with George on that statement, or just leave it alone. He opted to leave it alone, and he had it. I think he'd gotten it in May, and um, this was last summer when I first seen it. And um, he said. At that point, I think it was two months or two and a half months later, it was off about two seconds. Wow. <laughs> so he said, look, you know, you, didn't have, you couldn't understand it, but it looked bad on the machine, but it ran really well. Huh. Yeah, actually, in, in, in my experimental studies, that, that's sort of a problem. When you, you know, by getting readings on the machine and correlating with that performance is, is, uh, yeah, is a problem in itself. But anyway, I sort of eyeballed, and I wanted to simulate as close as I could get to this to see what the behavior would be. So I counted the turns. It's about 14 turns, plus or minus 78 degrees. Had that little hook out. That's about two coils at the 14th turn. Uh, it does have a laser welded collet, so it does come right out. And I sort of estimated the dimensions as well as I could. Uh, and so at this uh, performance at a 70 degree angle, Picture of it. Well, now that's pretty good. If you notice the scale on this, it's different than the other drawings. This is uh, like this is three seconds a day. So over this range, it's keeping uh, it would keep as isochronism behavior uh, better than two seconds per day. Uh, but if you move that to about uh, 75 degrees, no, we're kicking. Yeah, we're, we're kicking some butt here, boy. Not, uh, that air between around 150 degrees and 300 degrees is less than a, it would be less than a second. That's actually better than any of the over coils that kind. Uh, and that's interesting. Uh, uh, it's this, I just sort of eyeballed this one. So two things. Uh, gosh, it seems to work really well. And I was sort of pleased because uh, 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 I don't have one, but I assume uh, less that expensive keeps really good time and they figure out how to get these angles right. That, that, this is a simulation or a model. You modeled that thing yes. statement uh, just to, to hair Yes. Okay. Oh, 
And I compared with the drawing. Now the drawing would indicate now uh, I uh, don't actually have any contacts so make up these exact values, although if anyone actually can find these out, maybe uh run uh, it looked like it was really more than sixty degrees than seventy-five degrees. But you know, I kind of eyeballed it and estimated the size. I don't know how millimeters diameter or the coil spacing really is. I just kind of estimated it. But it's kind of satisfying that at least in principle the calculations agree with something they actually put into a watch and uh, it's, it's working. So it gives an excellent performance uh, in the simulation. Um, you know, point one is one to uh, close to minus one second uh, you know, in a theoretical sense. Every, uh, it's so small you never detect it in real life because every other error in the watch, positional, friction, all kinds of stuff would be much, would be a greater magnitude than that. So, uh, <coughs> so I was really pleased actually to, to get this result. result of this. I also looked at some more advanced treatments. Uh, when am I supposed to be over here, by the way? Yes. Some more advanced treatments, and I had some really helpful discussions, some with some with Ron, and some with uh, Vita Darkowski on, you know, the escapement is in there, and it's nothing to not, but it also depends on, you know, the Daniels has a different kind of escapement, and lever escapement, and uh, chronometer escapement, again, they get pushes in different places. Because uh, the impulse isn't really given at dead center. There's some impulse before, some after. When it hits the banking pin, it hits the, the slot, it, there's some force required to unlock it. So it steals some of the force, basically, to do the unlocking. And again, this is something that you can't really have as a formula easily, but you can actually simulate it fairly easily. But the problem with simulation is to guess how much force does it take to unlock it? Now, this is where we start to get a little speculative. Well, how much force does it take? Well, what's the friction between the uh, the jewel and the uh, escape wheel where it's unlocking and that kind of stuff. But I did some experiments to see what the effect is on the line. So I uh, basically had the unlocking uh, starting uh, various degrees, 15 before, 15 after. Um, I had unlocking the first six to eight degrees of motion of the balance wheel for unlocking, and then it would start the impulse and then have some impulse after the center. In the total escapement, uh, I did various experiments it was, uh, to lose time, various amounts, uh, in one and five seconds, seconds per day. Uh, it didn't have a big effect, and, uh, it, but lots of other things are involved. I'll talk about those in a second. Um, so this is what the effect of the unlocking an impulse would be versus just a center impulse. I forget what the anti degrees was, but you can see as, as it approaches down to the lift angle, I'm accurately uh, simulating that the watch is really slow and stops. Because <laughs> you, you can't have the amplitude go below the, below the lift angle. So, so uh, at least it was self-consistent that way. <clears throat> I say I've interposed the slide. When you had physical slides, you could say I dropped the box, but I didn't yeah. do that here. <laughs> um, but basically, one of the issues is that the less friction you have, the less extra push the escapement has to give it. So therefore, there's less really escapement error because it doesn't really have to whack it very hard. It's a lot of friction. There's a big error because it has to really whack it every time to get it going again. So it's not very much friction. It only has to give a tiny amount of impulse every time. Uh, they should have had this in the overcoil section, but uh, you may have seen Philip's rules. He had some uh, stuff about placement of center of gravity. It's the height r squared over L from the center of r is the radius, and L is the length of the terminal curve. Um, and, uh, I think it must have been very tedious for him to compute all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> and then also figure out what the right overcoil shape would be. Uh, but the problem is, is we've seen some of these little diagrams going overall. That's center of gravity. I don't care where you started it from. It zips around all over the place. It moves far about. And the other thing is the center of gravity is only a, a really big deal for vertical positions. How, how much would you say, I mean, you said your the plot of the center of gravity was pretty exaggerated. So how much, let's say it was a percent of diameter, is it's always generally staying on one side, never crossing right. the other. So how much of, of the, the radius of that radius between, you know, Based on the sense of the diameter of the balance, how much is it moving? Uh, good question. Actually, I can get back to you. It's like, yeah, I'd say like 10 to 15 percent stop and help off. I can actually get the figure figure out. It, it, it is amplified by about a factor of 10 in the picture. So you know, it doesn't, you know, someone else pointed out, oh, gosh, that center of gravity is moving off the edge of the hairspray. You can't have that. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and so this is, according to Phillips' rules, now with the fun of, uh, of uh, a little calculus and fitting, you can actually uh, change the open coil shape, put the uh, center gravity wherever you feel like in a wonderful simulation, uh, and also to design a, design a hairspring. And in this case, uh, well, the result wasn't that good. But uh, it didn't have a lot of studies on that yet. But it doesn't really seem to be, uh, to be honest, a super important thing. And again, that's uh, at least uh, so far in my studies, and that's the much for all of them. The other the really important point I haven't studied completely yet is the, is the effect of positional timing on the center of gravity in the vertical position. So I've looked a little bit on that, but I can't really draw a conclusion. Good point. No poison here. Metals will act like a combination of pendulum and balance wheel. It's kind of like gluing a pendulum on your balance wheel. Uh, and just uh, for the benefit of uh, the clock fans in the room, short digression on the pendulum. <laughs> Sources of error and mathematical complexity. Pendulum has their own uh, sources of error, some of which they share with the uh, balance wheels of uh, the uh, uh, Frequency depends on the amplitude. Their buoyancy, interesting, of air. Aerodynamics, they drag air with it and increase their, their mass, damping, temperature, support, like that. A lot of these actually came from, I think as of, at least some time ago, but they used to use pendulum to measure gravity, uh, local gravity. And part of the reason for that is uh, like if you're standing over heavy rocks, you have higher gravity than light rocks. If it's limestone, it's likely to have oil in it, you have less gravity. So it's a big commercial. <laughs> Uh, interest in making gravitometers. Uh, they've got much better methods now. But but just like in longitude, commerce inspired physicists to work day and night to, <laughs> to, to understand problems in many ways. But it's one of the earliest reliable methods. And you see things like pendulum takes the same amount of time to complete each swing. Uh, you see stuff like that in the museum. Uh, that's not really true. Even Christian Hugens knew it all about when you, when you invented this. In 1500, he had enough math to figure out that the, uh, the period of a pendulum depends a lot on the uh, on the amplitude. Uh, and the real mathematical behavior is, uh, is endlessly there. I have some kind of demented counterpart at the uh, British Horological Institute that publishes in I can't really criticize, can I? Who <laughs> 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 publish about the uh, uh, you know, the flexibility of carbon fiber rods I just saw and uh, the vibration of the pendulum itself. Uh, uh, and when you put an escapement on there, it's even more complex. It's really uh, chaos theory, please. <laughs> uh, actually, no, it really is. It's actually it's the, the example they use in chaotic mathematics is the driven pendulum. Not making this up. Uh, so let's look at this uh, pendulum isochronism versus the amplitude. Well, I looked at the scale on that. The reason that, yeah, yeah. Again, uh, the thing is it hangs. Like, this is the simulation. Again, uh, I already calculated this, but this, this solution is also in most advanced physics books on pendulum. The pendulum will hang theoretically at 180 degrees straight up, and so the, the, uh, the uh, amplitude goes to infinity. In fact, I mean, uh, the rate goes to infinity. But in, in the original region, it looks fairly flat, so you know, it's pretty good for a timekeeper. <laughs> now the problem is most people use an approximate formula where force equals uh, the length times uh, sine. Uh, well, the force actually, the force, the restoring force in the pendulum is, is proportional to sine of theta. The math buffs in the room. Uh, yeah. quick, uh, quick explanation of that. However, to make it easier, most people use approximation sine theta equals theta, and that leads to the familiar formula uh, for the period. Uh, if, if the angle is very small, that's pretty good. However, for horology, it's, it's, it's lousy. <laughs> uh, and the exact solutions actually are well known. Uh, they're called the Jacobian elliptic integrals. And, Unfortunately, I don't believe they have closed form solution for those, but I think there's no just formula you can use for all those. Uh, but the difference is big. For example, here is the dark is the real pendulum and the light is the approximate what you get by using an approximation. You can see pretty quick. 
you see pretty quick, there's a big difference between the two. So, uh, and actually, the rate's almost proportional to the square of the amplitude. Look at that rate again. Uh, well, that's not going to uh, be very exciting. To uh, uh, it doesn't uh, immediately say, "Boy, this is nice." Or and, if, and if it's happening in your watch, for example, it's not poised. This is real bad. <laughs> it's not good. Uh, you know, it's, it's like 300 seconds. That's about it's about five minutes a day or so, something like that. So again, it's uh, not something people will get excited about. And even the exact solution isn't used uh, by physicists. This is a fairly recent article on the physics of pendulums in a, in a scholarly journal. And you can see here that uh, they actually mention the complete solution, but they say, oh, we're going to use this perturbation expansion. As long as the angle is small and the amplitude is about 3 degrees, it is about a half a second error. Well, as long as you keep your amplitude balance going to be less than 3 degrees, you're all set, I guess. <laughs> so, so uh, back to towards it. <laughs> so this equation of motion, it's a beautiful equation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you gotta take it up in the workshop, uh, you know, right up with the uh, millimeter side. Like I said, you have to really convince it to actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, the difference, this is the angular motion. The uh, force of the head spring is here. The radius of the balance is here, and the angle of the heavy spot is here. And when you have the poising tool, you're actually measuring this NGL. Yeah, that's what you're actually, that's the factor you're uh, measuring. The, the amount of non-unpoised air and the uh, radius of the balance makes the torque arm of the uh, Anyway. Now that I put you to sleep with that. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the results I have, and these are <clears throat> interesting. Now, the zero poisoning error curve is the only one I've ever seen in watch-making mathematics books that they point out, uh, well, here's the poisoning error, and they show that one curve for the heavy point at the bottom. And that's actually where the worst error is. Many books actually say that well, the, when it's at the top, 180 degrees, it's equal in, equal in error in the opposite direction. Well, I don't really get that result. It actually uh, makes a difference. Interesting, like even the approximations show that there actually isn't an error if the heavy spot happens to be at 90 degrees or 270 degrees to where you are. Uh, of course, in a watch, that's not that big a deal if it's moving around, so that relationship to gravity is moving constantly. But in the clock, actually, if that's not moving around, that, uh, uh, you might accidentally muck out. Right? <laughs> uh, many texts say that people, I don't, I don't get that result. So, so your result at 180 is, is very, is a, is a lot less actually. Yeah. The heavy points are up. Yeah. A lot less than that. Hmm. So, so uh, at 90 would be. Yeah. 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 Or, or 270. Yeah. Makes sense. Maybe you can. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the good thing, even the approximate solution, which is uh, the vessel uh, function, uh, the vessel function that everyone uses, even that actually has the uh, has that same result. But no one ever seems to mention it. And you're saying when heavy spot is at the 90 degree, not necessarily. You're not talking about 90 degrees amplitude. Right. right. 90 right. degree position on the wheel. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. In its rest that's, position of gravity. Yeah. That's, but, that's right. Either horizontal. Position. Yeah. That's right. Gotcha. But, but you know, when you move your watch, all of a sudden now it's at zero yes. at the top of the yes. box. Uh, so the big error is that when it's zero, when it's at the uh, bottom, and when it has low amplitude, and you can use this to figure out where your heavy spot is when you, uh, you don't have good positional error. Well, I have an example of that too. Sacrifice came to one of my launches. Yeah. So this is it. Uh, poising air is about 220 degrees. And oh gosh, I get a very small amount of unpoised air. And I do get that same result. Now if you have larger amounts of air, that Connection spot moves more to the left, interestingly enough. Uh, and this, it's, uh, the differential equations into a couple. So, uh, yep. But in other positions, 
other than those cardinal points at 0, 90, uh, you don't get that same effect. And it's not clear whether other people have looked at this that carefully. Uh, I haven't actually found this result. Not only because I haven't, no, I haven't found a result where people actually gave you an example of other than the zero degree position actually in any watchmaking uh, books or even mathematical text. Did you do any empirical uh, checks on this with a watch on the timing machine at these different? Uh, actually, did. Is this, uh, no, and did you find that they matched this? Uh, well, sure what I got. Unfortunately, I said my watches aren't the really fine variety that would lend themselves to going to Because there is something going on, and you're on, you're on the right track because there's things that aren't, that theoretical don't match up to what I'm finding when I'm doing positional sure. air uh, poison. I did my bit of it, and, and I don't sit, so that's, that's very interesting. Uh, and this may, it may have not been solved exactly before, or people have solved it, they didn't actually tell other people about it often happens in science. Uh, uh, and I haven't seen a solution that didn't use an approximation. So this may be the first time that that could have been uh, noticed. And why haven't they been noticed again? Because this, this, uh, the function that they used to approximate it, the approximation, just like for the pendulum, is good for small angular uh, uh, displacements. You know, if this can we get results like this, we'll double check a lot. And so I keep double checking this to make sure I'm still uh, learning about the, the um, how much this uh, approximation, uh, how far it goes. But uh, I can only report the results I'm getting. So around 220 degrees amplitude at points other than the 0, 90, 180 position. You see, actually, pretty good. It makes a nice band. There is less. There's no, no, no question about it. The higher amplitude, it actually is good. That's that's not a question. It doesn't cancel out though nearly as well. You we still see some residual error as you as you rotate around. I was good to hear that. Uh, it seems at least some consistency. Yeah, I, I said I'm bumfuddled sometimes because it just doesn't make sense. What I'm really getting is the output. So, with a different way to graph the same data is to is to basically simulate a heavy spot. And look at actually every five degrees what the alien would be. And it makes at uh, 150 degrees amplitude, you see uh, at zero, it has a much bigger effect. So if you lower your amplitude of your, uh, of your watch, uh, you can find, well, that's what the zero point is, what that is. At 220 degrees, it is far reduced, and at these cardinal points, zero, uh, 90, 180, and 270. Uh, it is zero, but it has some fluctuation. And at 315, it also is still good. It has a nice little heart shape. Yeah. And it's still zero in these positions. So here's my example. This is my work. Now, here's the good news is that, uh, well, the, here, I, I planned this on purpose. It's a, uh, an Elgin 18 size. It's a grand old watch. And I can't get the amplitude above 180 degrees on that on the thing, so it's perfect for this, right? <laughs> um, and so I just uh, took out the uh, took out a balance screw. <clears throat> so this is a starting point. Uh, really, there's, there's no danger. I look at the scale on this thing. Right? Yeah, there's no danger of this thing called a chronometer anyway. <laughs> uh, so I took out a screw. In the, uh, now this is actually, I think I wrote down the wrong position, 11th position, I believe it would be the 8th position. And it bounced through off in the opposite direction immediately. And I think my son bumped the table there. And, I didn't get <laughs> and then if I lighten the screw and replace it at that point, it, uh, it you know, more or less, uh, it's better anyway, it improved the, uh, the time. Now. So it, it did seem to, uh, to correspond. Uh, Correspondingly, uh, yeah. I think I had some kind of scription error because I uh, I was looking at the front versus the back of the watch actually to get the data screw out. So uh, future studies I was looking at is you know, there's a lot of effect for isochronism on separating the regulator pins because if you if you do that at, at shorter arcs it's essentially three sprung and runs slower. Although there are, the problem with that is that there is a transition point at the time that it's free sprung and it starts hitting the pins and it has like a, a, a kink in the curve. So 
a marine chronometer for these points, which I understand, although I, I, I've been in contact with somebody who specializes in those, so he, he actually often didn't know what the pinning angle was. Uh, but for Rawlings, book, actually, it's close to 90 degrees, so those seem to agree with the... Uh, well, would you the, say that Rawlings was kind of your favorite writer in all of this yeah, research? Yeah, yeah, I like that guy. Uh, potentially more variables for overcoils, especially about that whole business about the position timing being good at, at zero. SJ mainsprings, I'm kind of fascinated about the power up there. And measurements on real watches to uh, confirm the theory. And in fact, I was working with this guy, some of you know, uh, Brian Mumford. As long as I'm making software, I like to make it look cool. So this is analyzing data from his microset timer that now actually reads watch text and recording it. So this is a recording of a real watch. You get a little tick there every time data comes in. And uh, because I'm such a big math fan, I figured how to compute the balance wheel amplitude and all that from all the, the noise that's coming in out of the watch. Uh, but the interesting thing we have here is I can move this up and down and expand it. So I can actually see all the ticks in the watch, all the in-between in noises. Uh, and I'm looking for the interpretation of what's actually happening inside uh, the watch to make those noises. Now I know that uh, the events that are published, there's like five noise positions and stuff. It doesn't always correspond to exactly what you're hearing and things jumping around in here. So that's something else I'm looking to using a, a tool like this. Uh, and I just recently uh, was working with them to get this ability to actually measure the amplitude and the rate to start working on uh, sort of now. Uh, I'd like to have sort of a practical piece in addition to the theory to show, well, here's a theory and here's the results on some watches. And some acknowledgments, uh, I had a lot of discussions with Rick uh, Jarkowski, who, who corrected my nomenclature in many cases to be a <laughs> typical watchmaker nomenclature. Uh, to run, uh, I think also for some helpful discussions, and uh, they're going to ask questions about this. <laughs> you better look into that. Uh, the AWI, and uh, it's really a, an honor actually to be invited here. And, and, uh, I'm probably the only person here who's not a professional watchmaker, and I. Uh, it's sort of an honor to be invited to speak to you about the results I have, although uh, I'd say, it's, as you can tell, it's something of an obsession and something a little bit more than a casual, uh, a casual hobby. And I thank you for uh, coming here to see my talk. Can we ask you a question? Yeah. I have noticed lately, I've had uh, more than one Rolex brand new that, that I knew had never been opened by anyone except maybe Stan and Bob Ruckart. But anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was quite sure they'd never been opened. These springs were definitely, over both springs, were definitely all center. I'm not sure if the last adjuster did not do it correctly or was in a hurry or if this was purposely done. I'm just wondering if anyone else has had you this. You all have seen the same thing. thing. Yeah, and I, I couldn't believe how much it was shock. Yeah, I think they're moving because of shock. Because the springs on Rolex are very they, soft. Did they run well? Stay? Yeah. And they were always on 31 35s. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. The ones yes. I've seen, every, every one, one of them. Yeah. Okay, then, then I just yeah. wanted to see if it was yes. what you guys were doing. Or if it was... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you open the case back of those pliers. <laughs> <laughs> I also just, you know, I do a lot that's of that's dumb that's things that's that that's I'm considered kind of a heretic. But I've taken, uh, <laughs> uh, I've taken watches, a Rolex that I had completed with overpoles now, free sprung, and I have, um, uh, no, 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 flat. And I've done the timing thing. And I have purposely thrown it off center <coughs> for other reasons and checked the positional errors and found almost no difference, more than once. And even in a couple cases where the hairspring runs so close to the stud or anchoring position, I purposely thrown them away from that a little bit in order to uh, alleviate a problem of them coming back with the hairspring caught. And, I, and check the position at rates both ways and tell almost no difference. So I'm really wondering how much theory and practical agree or disagree on this airspring being centered business. 
Uh, no problem. So it does. It does depend on variables like the, yeah, the uh, elasticity, yeah. the strength of the hairspring, and the mass of the hairspring, and things like that. Number of coils too. With it. Yeah. Because if it's a very light hairspring, very low mass, yes, the, the lighter the hairspring, the less the positional in all cases would be because it, there's less weight to sag under gravity. Yeah. 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 So. But the three things about that point were that you made was that that by throwing it off center like that, would that, that would increase unlocking friction, correct? Uh, no, it would just increase the pivot friction. That's right, which would increase unlocking friction. That, well, no, no maybe. Well, the unlocking is just the force that takes the sorry, drag piece right. pallet stone off the escape. That's piece. right, it would increase starting friction. Well, it just, it just increases the, the friction on the, on the pivot. Pivots right? again, yeah. Okay. And then the isochronism that right. I got from that would be if you're, if you're throwing it off center, you're more nearly equalizing the friction, the dual friction, the dual friction between your pendant and your uh, and your dial positions. You're more nearly equalizing them actually when you throw it off center. As it is, when you have a hairspring that absolutely centers that pivot, and let's say theoretically it's not touching the side of the jewel, theoretically then the only friction it has is on the end of the pivot. And if that's curved, the radius of that is almost nil. It's very low. Yes, and, and so therefore, your different differential between your end position and your running position is considerable. Right. If you throw it off center and push it against the side of the jewel, you're more nearly equalizing. But I know I'm getting in very dangerous territory. And so down to me. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, but, but wouldn't but would that, what the positional variation be much higher on one that was constantly against because then you also have the weight of the balance and the spring pulling on that right. point in a different position and would that not decrease your isochronism or, or make it much worse in that case because you're piling friction upon one another on one side and on the other side you're relieving friction right. but due to gravity but remember your balance is well but the, but the pivots staying in the same. Yeah. The forces on the sides of the pivots will be different in the two opposite positions. Yeah. At 90 and 270, we, it wouldn't matter. We may be in slightly side. different political parties. <laughs> 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 well, I'd like to thank uh, Matt for coming.